bless you. Amen. We're here to worship the Lord and give him all the praise that he's worthy of. And, and then I was texting with Brother Mark Hall this morning and he was asking about some things. And I said, all I know is this morning, come expecting the unexpected. I believe God's going to move in a supernatural way. I believe this service is anointed. Amen. I know, I know Brother Timothy was preparing to minister and he's sick. Brother Aaron has stepped in to minister this morning. And man, there's many changes that we see, but God doesn't see any changes. He sees a plan. Amen. Amen. And I know um, many of you may have heard by now, Brother Ron has just publicly announced that they have found cancer now in his eye. So the cancer has been found there. Amen. But we have a supernatural God. Amen. And I don't know what you're here to do this morning, but I, I'm here to worship that God. I'm not here to be afraid. I'm not here to worry. I'm not here to, amen, do anything but I'll throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah.
nothing else fit for you except for a heart
Amen. I want to remember to pray for Sister Trish Pruitt's father, Paul. He's been diagnosed with a cancerous tumor on his thyroid. They're planning to remove the tumor on the 25th. I want to remember that need in prayer. also want to remember to pray for little Rowan Pruitt. She's been sick and amen, has some congestion and cough. Also, Brother Jonathan Middleton requests prayer for TJ, who's been sick in his body. Also, Brother Timothy Pruitt has been sick. He says he's feeling a little better today, but I want to continue to remember him. Also, Brother Roger Maxwell has a prayer in his uh, body for his ankle. He needs a touch there. Amen. We already mentioned Brother Ron and these different ones that we, amen, are going to continue to ask for. I also want to um, remember Brother Tim as he's away this morning. Amen. I'm going to ask my brother, Brother David, if he'd come open the service in prayer for us. And, amen. If you have a need this morning, amen, I believe that we're here to give him all that we have. And if all of you have is a hallelujah, all of that you have is a lifted hand, all that you have is a heart that just wants to shout to him and tell him how much you love him, Amen. I believe we can do that this morning with all of our hearts. And amen. And praise his name. Hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it's not much. Nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We also want to remember to pray for Sister Danette, excuse me, Danette Pruitt. She's been sick with a cough and fever and ask that we'd remember her in prayer this morning. Let's all pray. Father, it's such a special moment that we're in, Lord. We just uh, will look back, Father, and understand it better than we do even now, Father. But we just ask, Lord, right now, as Brother Tim ministers in Virginia, Lord, that you would just surround him, Father. Lord, that you would just give him direction as he preaches, Father. Lord, that the very words that you'd want spoken would just come from his mouth, Lord God. Lord, we're just lifting up Brother Ron, Lord, all the different others in their congregation with needs that they mentioned this morning, Father. Lord, you're more than enough, God. We just seek your will, Lord. God, I ask that you would just move in a supernatural way among, among all of those people, Lord. And we're so thankful, Father, that you can be there and you won't leave us out here, God. But we're just looking to you this morning, Father. Lord, we're just lifting each need that was mentioned, Lord, and we just ask that you would meet each one, Father. Lord, there's special times that you do special things, Father. We ask that today would be one of those days, Lord. Lord, that the angels of God would just sweep through the building, Lord, and meet the needs of the people, Father. Lord, if there's a sinner in our midst or a backslider, Lord, I ask that while well, the word would go forth, conviction would strike, Father, and it would be like that story of the man who was testing the sound, and he said, repent or perish, and that man fell and repented. Father, we ask that there just be such a supernatural presence in this building, Lord. Lord, that nobody would leave worse than they came in, Lord, but you would just be found to be the conqueror in our midst, Father. We're just looking to you, Father. Lord, you are able, Father, and here we are willing, Lord, to just, Lord, just come and worship you with all of our heart, Lord. We just want to lay everything aside, everything, Father, that would hinder. God, anything that we've done, said, thoughts that we've had through the week that weren't pleasing to you, Lord, we just ask, Father, your forgiveness, Lord. We come to you, Lord, and we just ask that in purity, Lord, we just come, Father, and you would just accept our worship, Lord. We invite you, Father. We welcome your presence, Father. Lord, we're just expecting you, Lord. We know you're here, Father, because we're here and you came with us, Father. But we ask that you would just make yourself manifest this morning. Lord, that you would just anoint Brother Aaron, Father, that you would use him, Lord, as never before, Lord. Those that are on the stream, Father, ask that you'd minister to them too, Lord God. As I was reading about the life of Elijah this week, and there was that woman who had a need, and you said, I have commanded her to sustain you. And he had a long journey to get to that woman. About 80 miles he had to travel through the hills and the mountains, and he finally got to her when she had her last meal. 
The whole time, Lord, you cared. The whole time as he journeyed, Father, and she counted down the meals to her last meal, Father, you cared. You knew, Father, there was a predestined moment when your prophet would show up, Father, and today's a predestined moment when your minister would come and just preach what's on his heart, Father, without fear. We love you, Father. I ask that you just be in the whole service, Father. Those on the stream, Lord, like that widow woman who couldn't come to the prophet, Lord, I ask that you would just minister to them today, Father. Those that would watch the archive, minister to them, Lord God. We just love you, Lord. We give the service to you, each part, Lord. I ask, Father, that each song, Lord, wouldn't just be sung out of ritual, Father, but your spirit would be behind it, Father. Lord, that you would come in the music, you'd come in the worship, Father. Each one would do their part. We give it to you, Lord. God, may this not be a normal service, Father. But may it be a supernatural moment, Lord. That's what we expect in Jesus Christ's name. Bless the offering. sing that with all our heart this morning. All my soul needs, yes, and all my soul needs is all your love to cover me so world. Yes, we'll see. If you could play that video, brothers, there's a video clip with some audio. And, amen. As she does, ask Sister Courtney if she'd come up and make ready for her special. Ron said that he dreamed this morning, this Wednesday morning, said Andrew and myself were speaking in a beautiful gymnasium. He said we were standing besides one another and our, our people were sitting in the and bleacher seats and the floor was as it is now in our church. He said, the place was at capacity. And he, he said, I was speaking with like a mask on and Drew was wearing a hat, like a statement hat. He said, we was going full blast. I was brought a note and I went to an office to read the note 
He said, I removed my mask and coming out to speak with Drew a moment and he removed his hat. And the announcement was made, the curse is over and the place erupted. He said, I don't know what it all means, but it was some feeling. He shared it with Brother Tim Pruitt and Brother Tim sent the interpretation to the dream. The mask represents your sickness. The hat represents Andrew's declaration of faith. The note is a word from God. The mask removed means the sickness is over. The hat removed means faith has achieved its victory. The announcement is the curse and its trial is over. The place erupting is its shouts of victory heard around the world. I was driving on Thursday morning and I'd taken the kids to school that morning and I was just praying as I was traveling back and I, I was driving and I began to think, begin to think about this dream that Brother Ron had and how the Spirit of the Lord had came down and dealt with him. And, and I was beginning to think about this dream and I really begin to pray about it. And the Lord dealt with me, he just sweeped into the car. And I could just hear him say, say these words. Write Sister Courtney Dexter and ask her if she could write a song to this dream. You know, if you would come to me and say, Brother Andrew, dream me a dream, you know I couldn't do that. Or if you would come to me and say, Brother Andrew, preach me a sermon. Unless the gift begins to activate, it, it just doesn't work that way. So I knew that when I had felt led to write Sister Courtney to put a song to this dream, I knew that the Lord was in it. And literally within moments of texting Brother David Dexter and writing Sister Courtney, literally in moments, she had put the things with you. Brother Ron had a dream on Wednesday morning.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We didn't sing, I didn't have her sing that song this morning as a tribute to Brother Ron. He's heard it already. Amen. The battle's over for you this morning. Amen. Amen. You hear a shout of victory this morning. Amen. It's been hard, but you're a soldier. Amen. Amen. He may. Brother Ron's service from last night, and it was such a huge blessing. And this song just touched me. I was just weeping through it, and you can feel free to join me. Just had it on my heart to sing. Filled with 
Choir comes. I am not alone. He's my comfort. Always holds me close. Yes, I.
victory over the enemy and the world can do me no harm. Oh, I've got victory over the enemy and the world can do me no harm. Yes, I Thank you.
Of, of bad news and in, in the face of a bad doctor's report in the face of an evil world around us we've still got joy we've still got victory and we've still got peace it's the atmosphere that the bride lives in it's an atmosphere of victory it's an atmosphere of peace hallelujah isn't it good to be in the house of God this morning amen you know I know they talked about it already but you know, yesterday, Brother Matthew Spencer called me and tell me the, the newest report on Brother Ron. And you know, it's incredible. I, I was talking to him about it, and I said, I said, y'all don't understand what a testimony y'all are. You, you, don't, you don't understand that you know, bad report after bad report after bad report. And you see, yes, Brother Ron, but an entire family with their shoulders squared back saying, I've got victory over the enemy and the world can do me no harm. You know, he said, the doctor said that he's got cancer in both eyes and they believe that it's come from the brain. And he says, Isaiah 53 says, God is my healer. And I believe that we ought to be able to stand with him today. You know, I know you've prayed for him for four years. And look, here we are. Four years later, the prayers have worked. Don't back off now. I'm going to ask you the same thing that, that Brother Andrew asked his church. Consecrate yourselves. And pray for him more fervently than you've ever prayed before. Because the devil just threw everything he had at him. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, I believe... I believe that the word is true, that he's going to raise up a standard of healing. No harm. No harm. Can we pray this morning? Heavenly Father, what an atmosphere, Lord. Lord, an atmosphere of faith and an atmosphere of believing, an atmosphere, Lord, where all things are possible. Lord, I pray this morning that you'll move me aside, Lord. Lord, completely, and may you just speak. Lord, maybe it seems off of what I studied. Maybe I don't even understand where I'm going, Lord, but will you speak this morning? Lord, take control, Lord, in this atmosphere. I know, Lord God. Lord, I know you want to speak and you want to move. Lord, right now we remember Brother Ron, Lord. Lord, in such a, in such a battle. And yet, Lord, what a soldier he's been. Lord, as they've stood there in faith, as he's ministered the gospel time after time after time, I can declare unhesitatingly that you've used him like never before. Lord, and I see a man that has trusted you with his life. And now I pray, Lord, that you give it to him. Satan, we come before you as the bride of Jesus Christ and we command you to take your hands off of God's property. Not only off of Brother Ron, but of the bride around this world, the ones that you've afflicted and that are struggling. There's many even here in our own assembly, our dear sister Jeannie battling cancer, many other problems and sicknesses. But it's time that you let go. It's time that the house of hell give way to the name of Jesus. And we stand and speak this morning because we believe. Lord, and we believe that you would never fail and that your will is to heal. And so we place it in your hands now, Father, and we believe you. Lord, have your way now in this service. We thank you that you're here. Lord, we always know you're here, but we thank you when it's special and we can feel you move in the building. Lord, speak to every heart now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to ask you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, the first chapter, 
And we'll read the very first three verses before we turn over to Ephesians, the second chapter. Amen. Ain't God good? Amen. Amen. He sure is. It's, it's wonderful when, when God's people come together and, and begin to worship him and to feel him move into the place like he has this morning. Hallelujah. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. If you'll turn also with me to Ephesians, the second chapter. And we'll read the first seven verses there as well. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. You know, right here in this verse, it's almost a, a parallel to verse 2 in Genesis. You had a chaotic earth. There was chaos, but God moved. And then he describes our lives, and we were in sin, and we were in darkness, and we were in shambles, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ. Amen. Pray the Lord will add his blessings to the word as you take your seats this morning. What we see right here in verse 2 is it tells us that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. In other words, he rules in high places, in heavenly places. And the reason he was there is because man fell, and we'll get more into that later. And we fell from our position. It allowed Satan to move into that position and began to rule from there. And therefore, we no longer could attain heavenly places. So it places him there, and it shows that he is there. But then it comes right on down. And in verse 6, it says, but he's raised us up together. So now we've been raised up again to make us sit together where? In heavenly places. So it shows our restoration right here. But notice it doesn't show Satan cast down at this point. So it's still a contested place. Even though we have a right to go there and battle for it, he's still there accusing you and telling you you don't have a right to be here. We're going to get into that more as we go because we live in a time where the atmosphere all around us is very unsettled. It's a very unsettled time, and many times I don't think we, uh, we appreciate the significance um, and the role that atmosphere plays in our lives. It, it's a, a, we don't recognize its importance in a good marriage, uh, its importance in a good home, its importance in church and the services that, that we have. It, it's something that we should work to foster a positive atmosphere. An atmosphere of faith, an atmosphere of believing, an atmosphere of uplifting. Atmosphere is very important and it should be fostered and it should be centered on the word of God in all aspects of our life. And, and many times we don't, we don't recognize this, but it's the truth. And Brother Branham, will we'll see quotes that back this up. Oftentimes what we receive or don't receive... What we receive or don't receive is a direct result of the atmosphere that we operate in. You'll find that positive people tend to have more positive things happen to them, or at least they recognize the positive in the things that happen to them. When when man lives in in a negative atmosphere and he's constantly living in the negative, he will produce negative results. 
It's just the way it is. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, really, is, is what it is. And, and you get those people that, that have that Eeyore, woe is me atmosphere, and that's exactly what you're going to produce in your life. And the same thing goes for church. If, if you come to the house of God with, well, I guess we'll see. Well, I guess how, we'll see how this service is going to go. Oh, they're talking about blessings again, but my life's in shambles. Oh, here they go, talking about the moving of the Spirit again so people can run and shout. And Oh, here they go. He's got victory over the enemy. Well, then that's what you're going to get out of every single service. You're going to walk in defeated. Unless you change the atmosphere in which you operate, you're going to walk out defeated. But what I'm telling you is this morning, you don't have to live in that atmosphere. You have been called to be the creator of atmospheres. You get to choose the atmosphere in which you live in. And I say in a day which the word has been restored, which the seals have been opened, which God has come back once again to fellowship with God between God and man, we should be living in the most happy, most positive, most overcoming atmosphere of anybody that's ever lived on the face of the earth. We know we're standing on the edge of a rapture. How much happier, how much more positive, how much more excited could we be? And yet we get a lot of this. We get a lot of negativity. You come with that atmosphere and it not only affects you in a church service, but in reality, it hinders the entire atmosphere. And it'll keep it from reaching the levels that that moment could have reached. Oh, but Brother Aaron, it was a great surf. It sure was. What could it have been? Where could we have gone? What miracles could have taken place? Well, we're not looking for that every surf. Well, speak for yourself. I am. I'm looking for the exceeding abundantly every time we come together. I'm not sure why you showed up this morning. I didn't wake up to waste time. I didn't come together to see all your smiling faces, even though I do love you. Y'all are wonderful people, but I came to see him move. And when he moves, there's the miraculous. The sick are healed. The lost are saved. The, the, the justified get sanctified, and the sanctified get filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to see it every time we come together. So let's come in a positive attitude. Lay aside your mother grubs. Lay aside how you've been hurt here and hurt there. And let's press the battle. Let's press into the atmosphere of the Holy Ghost where all things are possible. When we speak of atmosphere and it being unsettled, it's true that the world is in an uproar over the atmosphere right now as it relates to the climate. They're in, up, in an uproar over that and, and as it relates to the weather. And surely, we, we, know, we know that Satan can get in that and stir that up. Absolutely he can. But, but the unsettled atmosphere that I'm really speaking of would be the surrounding influences in the, spirit, uh, in the spiritual and the political environment in which we live in today. The time we live in has been placed in the scripture by a prophet in this day as the Laodicean age. It is the last age, and therefore it is what is commonly known, even amongst many nominal churches, that this is known as the end time. But we don't guess about that. We know. This is the end time. And now it's not unique in one sense that there have been other end times before. There was an end time in Noah's day. There was an end time in the days of Sodom. Uh, the Bible will even hearken to those days as representation of how things will be in this day. Because those were end times. There was an end in Jesus' day as it was the end of the Jewish dispensation. However, we say all these things, and they do relate to today, but I want to emphasize this is not an end time. This is the end time. This is the wrapping up of all things. This is the winding up of time. This is where the whole thing that God ever planned, even from back before we were in, in, in existence here upon the earth, back in the back part of his mind, this is where all of that wraps up in a rapture. And, and, then, and then from there, here upon the earth, there's a tribulation, and, and then there, there's a wedding supper, and there's a millennium, and then there is eternity. This is the end time. 
And we can find similarities in, in the other end times that relate to this time. But when it comes down to the fact that we stand on the edge of the rapture of the church. And, and when we stand at the edge of the change of our bodies, we can boldly say there has never been a day like this day. There has never been a time like this time. And yet the atmosphere around us is troubled and it's stirred up just as the Bible said it would be. I've said this before and I'll say it again. The end time condition should not trouble a believer. It should not bother a believer. It should not upset a believer. It should be a confirmation that everything you've ever believed and ever been taught is absolutely the truth. It would trouble me if all of a sudden everything was really good and really smooth and perfect. And it went on that way and I'd look around and go, wait, where are we? Where are we at in time? I don't understand this. But because the scriptures tell us that this is how it's going to be, then I can look around and go, perfect. I'm standing right where the prophet of God told me I was to be standing. Things are exactly how the word said it was going to be. This doesn't trouble me. This anchors me ever more so to know that when you see these things going on around you, look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. Listen, we don't got to wait ages and ages for the return of the Lord. The return of the Lord is happening now. We are in the midst of the rapture of the church. It is a process. There's a shout, and it has gone forth, and now the church is being prepared to go up into a rapture. 2 Timothy 3.1 lays out the characteristic of the last days, and and I just have a few of them here and a couple of them I even paraphrase. But it says it'll be perilous. Yeah. That means dangerous. Check. It says men will be lovers of themselves. That means they will be selfish. Here we are. They will be blasphemers, unholy, no natural affection, false accusers, fierce. That means they will be savage. Or untamed like beast. Despisers of those who are good, lovers of pleasure. First Timothy 4 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, I looked at that and I just thought, just, I thought about America in general, not necessarily what we call the, the message, but just Christianity as a whole. And I got to looking at some numbers, and it says about 64% of Americans call themselves Christians today. It says that might sound like a lot, but 50 years ago, that number was 90%. Many have departed from the faith and have had their conscience seared with a hot iron. And it says, and I don't, I don't have it right here, but it says, if this rate continues, by the year 2070, Christianity would be extinct in America. Listen, that number ain't going up. That number ain't stabilizing. Churches are closing their doors day after day after day after day because there aren't enough people to even come and sit in the pews to even keep the lights on. They are departing from the faith. And yet in the midst of all that, there's actually been a people that's been turned back to the faith. To the faith of the fathers. And while others are going down, just like it was seen in the vision, there is a people getting stronger and stronger and stronger and growing and growing and growing. Listen, this trial can come. This tribulation can come. Did it make your faith waver? No, absolutely not. It just shook the dirt enough to let my roots go deeper and deeper and deeper. Listen, Satan is barking up the wrong tree. If he thinks this bride is about to quit, if he thinks we're about to back off preaching divine healing, if he thinks we're about to give up, on our prodigals out there in the world. We're not giving up. We're on the verge of the greatest, most miraculous events in history. I'm standing firm, and I'm saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. I listened to Brother Donnie last night talk about his precious daughter, Erica. And he said, I believe more now than I ever have. 
He said, I'm going to pray for the sick now more than I ever have. I'm going to have prayer lines more now than I ever have. Listen, hard blows from the devil don't make a real believer quit. It makes me recognize I got to buckle up. I got to ante up. And I got to come back to the middle. Listen, bell's ringing. It's time for the next round. I can sit there in the ring and throw in the towel and say I quit and go down with the rest of them. Or I can rise up in faith and say, yet he slay me, yet I'll serve him. He's a good God. He's a mighty God. He is an overcomer. He is a conqueror. And his children are the same thing. I'm not quitting. I'm not backing up. I ain't going away. We're not leaving until we leave here. We're here to stay, devil. We're here to stay. And we're operating in an atmosphere of faith. Matthew 24 tells us that nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The accuracy of these scriptures and how it describes the current state of the world is actually astounding. I mean, it's not like, well, I can kind of see that. No, it's pinpoint. It's pinpoint. This is the end time. And the atmosphere is tore up and whipped up by devils. Atmosphere of oppression is what people live in every single day. It's an atmosphere of attacking where people look for any reason to attack their fellow man. Atmosphere of hatred. Atmosphere of nervousness. Everybody's on edge. It's an atmosphere of fear and anxiety. And there is no peace to be had. You know, I was thinking about this just the other day. We had a situation where one of our cars broke down and I had to call a tow truck. And, and the guy came and picked it up and towed it and dropped it off. And I was just standing there talking to the guy. He seemed friendly enough. And I said, man, I bet, you know, being in this job, sometimes you get put in some dangerous situations, huh? He said, oh, every single day. He said, but I ain't worried about it. He said, somebody go ahead and shoot me. Just put me out of my misery. <laughs> I was like, man, that, that turned so quick. <laughs> he said, I was just trying to talk to God. And he, he's hoping I'd shoot him. But I, I left there, and it actually was heavy on me for a minute. And I said, that's how people are walking around in misery. There's no peace to be had. Because the world that we live in is not conducive to peace. The atmosphere all around us is unsuitable for peace. And the reason that is is because the one who has dominion over this atmosphere, the one who has dominion over this earth because we fail, the one who has dominion over all the kingdoms of the earth is a liar and a murderer and the father of it. You can't have peace when the atmosphere is ruled by a liar and a murderer. Brother Branham said here in Victory Day, he said, Jesus said in St. Matthew 24, said you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars and wars and war. Why? Because the prince of the earth, Satan, the power of the nations, there's a national spirit here. A national spirit here, it's devils. Amen. They can't get along with one another, see? Now, stop for just a minute before we read too deep into that. Just because you can't get along with somebody <laughs> don't mean it's because they're devils. <laughs> That's good. But what Brother Branham says here is he says that is why there's wars and rumors of wars. Because the devils that run the atmosphere of those nations cannot get along with one another. And so what I'm speaking on to you today is the battle for atmospheres. The battle for atmospheres. So notice the current atmosphere we live in is controlled by the devil. By Satan himself, the prince of the power of the air. Now, when we say that, like I already said, when it said the prince of the power of the air, many times we just take that and think we mean the weather. Well, tornadoes came. He's the prince of the power of the air. That's true. That's not a wrong application. But it's also speaking about the atmosphere 
in which the world lives under and operates in. Because many times, Brother Branham would take and tie that, that scripture about the prince of the power of the air multiple times right into the temptation of Jesus when he offers him all the kingdoms of the world. He would say it something like this. This is in the message of Elijah. The Bible said so. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and every nation is under his dominion. The scripture says that Satan, he says Satan quoted it to Jesus, said the whole world, all these kingdoms of mine, and I will do with them what I will. So when we see the scriptures that we've read about the end time and how pinpoint it is, and like I said, it's something that we recognize has to be fulfilled. That has to be fulfilled. The end time must be evil. The atmosphere must be that disturbed, that tore up. That, it seems like we're on the edge of, of civil war in our country all the time. It seems like we're on the edge of World War III all the time. The atmosphere is troubled. And that's exactly how it had to be. These things must come to pass. And as bleak as that sounds, I'm not trying to paint a bleak picture to you. As bleak as it sounds, it shouldn't shake us even one little bit because they aren't the events that the bride is supposed to be focused on when it comes to end-time scriptures. There are other end-time scriptures that we find our identification in. I look right here at an end-time scripture in Acts 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams I identify with that scripture well the world's falling apart yeah well the Lord is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh well this is going on over here and Russia's doing that well there's visions happening there's prophecies going forth and the spirit of the Lord is being manifested amongst his people I find my identification there 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, well, there's going to be bombs and there's going to be this. Okay, okay, that's fine, but I find my identification where it says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We should be focused on the fact that the atmosphere is charged with the coming of the Lord. It's right here upon us. We're in the very moments of his appearing. The coming of the Lord Jesus is at hand, church. He promised us Malachi 4. He did it. He promised restoration. He did it. He promised to pour out his spirit, and he's doing it. He promised us healing. He's doing it. He promised us salvation for us and our offspring, and he's doing it. He promised to come back and take away a bride, and he's going to do it. All these promises are the truth. Brother Branham spoke about the, about the atmosphere there in Jerusalem. And that atmosphere was just as stirred up at the time of Jesus as our atmosphere is. It was just as stirred up, and he, he, it was an end time, and... And the politics were awful, and there was Roman oppression, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were fighting amongst themselves, and zealots were riding in the streets and fighting against the Romans. The atmosphere was awful in Jerusalem. It was an awful time and an awful place. But to those that held on to the words of Jesus, to those that knew he said he was coming to the Passover feast, they were gathered in little homes and looking out their windows anxiously and, and, and they had their palm leaves ready and the atmosphere was charged with his appearing. To those expecting him, the atmosphere was charged with his coming. How charged should we be? What kind of anticipation should we be living under? Where, where, where should our thinking be on it? How excited should we be to serve the Lord? To have an opportunity, an opportunity to be the ones who are alive and remain. What a privilege to have received the message from the seventh church age messenger, the one who came to tie it all up. How excited we should be to serve the Lord. And if you're not, it's because you're not expecting his appearing. You're not expecting his coming. But Brother Branham says the Christian knows it's the coming of the Lord, see. There's an atmosphere. 
It depends on what you're looking at. There was a prophecy went forth last night over the pulpit there at Full Gospel Lighthouse. As Brother Andrew began to speak, and I don't have the whole thing. You, you can go listen to it at the end of the service. And it came forth very powerfully. I am the Lord God Almighty. And he speaks about being I am Alpha and Omega. And one thing I love that he said, it was I formed you before the foundation of the world and no one can erase you. He said, no one can erase you. But it came right down. It said at the end, do not slumber. The rapture is upon the church. Do not slumber. I don't know, maybe this is a silly analogy, but how many of you, maybe children would understand how it feels maybe, um, maybe the day before Christmas. Or maybe how you feel when you fits and get to go on some big exciting trip and, and you know you got to get up at five in the morning to catch a plane. And you lay down, but do you sleep well? No, you can't slumber because you are excited. How can you slumber? How can you slumber? How can you slip into an atmosphere of negativity? How can you slip into an atmosphere of the Lord hath delayed his coming? How can you slip into an atmosphere of God don't move like that anymore? How can you slip in that kind of atmosphere if you're excited and you know he's coming? He's coming. He's right here at the door. Oh, just in the morning, we may get up and go. Just in the morning, tomorrow morning may be the time. How can you slumber? And it shows your condition. If you're able to slumber, if you're able to be lukewarm, if you're able to be nonchalant about it, you're not excited about it because you're not expecting him to really return. Or if you are, you're not expecting it in the morning. Maybe some far off yonder, maybe years down the road. Maybe so, but you don't know when he's coming for you. So live excited. Live ready. Serve the Lord with purpose. Do not slumber the coming of the Lord. The rapture is upon the church. Do not slumber. Brother Bram says there's an atmosphere. It depends on what you're looking at. For our Lord has strictly told us what was going to happen at that time. And we don't know the minute or hour, but know that we're nearing something now. Amen. You can feel it in the atmosphere. Church, it's been dark a long time, but day is about to break. Amen. You can feel it in the atmosphere. You can feel it charged through a place like it did this morning. When the Lord comes down in a mighty way and there's just something different, you just feel it pulsating. Something's about to happen. Something's about to take place. You'll forgive us if we get a little bit excited because our Lord's coming. Forgive us if we get a little bit excited because we hear the wagon wheels coming. I was a nobody. I was a little washed girl. I didn't deserve anything. I was lost and bound for hell. But he said, I'm coming back for you. Others didn't believe it. Others said, you're unworthy. Others said, you sinned too much. Others said, you was an alcoholic. Others said, you was a druggie. Others said, you did too many things. There's no way he'd ever want you. But I hear the wagon wheels coming. I hear it coming. Forgive me if I get excited. I've been forgiven so much. I've been forgiven so much. It excites me that he's coming back for me. I I can't slumber now. I can't slumber now. He's coming back for me. Day is about to break. And yet, all that being said, it is a constant war to live in and operate in the right atmosphere. It is a constant fight because we are affected by the atmosphere that surrounds us at all times. Doesn't mean we give in to it. Doesn't mean we cave into it. But the Bible would describe it as a smoke. And you know how it is. You ain't got to be, just walk through it. You walk through this atmosphere every day, walk through smoke for a little bit. It affects your clothes. It gets on you. That's why we come time after time to be washed Washed by the water of the word. I'm not saying you fail in sin. I'm saying junk gets on you. And you want to be washed from it and cleansed. And we get affected by it. And you can have a bad day because of the atmosphere around you. Look, I'm realistic. We're human. You go to work and your boss treats you like dirt and yells at you and blames you for stuff and does this. And I don't expect you to come home and be like, "Woo, hallelujah, what a wonderful day. It was awesome. I hope I can do that again tomorrow. No, that's, that's not what I'm saying. 
I understand that it affects us. And so it is a battle to keep the right attitude towards promises. To keep the right attitude towards people. Yeah, people. We have to operate from the same place of grace and forgiveness that Jesus operated towards us when it comes to people. Regardless of their intent, purpose, not on purpose, meant to hurt, didn't mean to hurt, lay all that aside. Because the atmosphere that we live in is to assign blame. Whose fault is it? Well, who? Well, what? what? But Jesus doesn't lay blame. He offers forgiveness and grace. And if you'll operate in the place that without giving forgiveness, you can't have forgiveness. Without offering grace, you can't have grace. Then it'll change your perspective on a lot of things. Sitting there being nailed to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now, that being said, I've had people say, well, I mean, well, yeah, that was Jesus. Of course, of course he could. Okay, well, let's point to uh, just a regular man filled with the Holy Ghost, Stephen, being stoned. And he says the exact same thing. Lord, don't lay this to their charge. Lord, don't hold this against them. Stone. Psh. Lord, forgive that man. Psh. Lord, I hope he knows you. Easy to do? No. Hardest thing ever. But you got to operate from that place or else you'll find yourself with grudge after grudge after grudge and hurt after hurt after hurt and funny feeling after funny feeling. And I can't fellowship with this one. I don't want to sit by that one. And then this one gets up to saying, but I can't even be blessed by it because I don't like this. And she said that. And what about this one here? And look at him preaching. I probably at some point in my life said something smart aleck to you. I'm sorry. I believe it's very important to be self-aware and understand your own shortcomings and your own faults. Because when you can't recognize yours, you don't have grace for others. Hey, you don't even know. Me and this guy's buddies. Amen. Was that always the case? No, sir. <laughs> you have grace for people. Let God in a relationship. He'll mold it up and fix it up and make it right. But the problem is we're judging them through our own self-righteousness and how we think they should have and they shouldn't have and they shouldn't have. And if you'll combine your list of shouldn't have with their list, yours probably longer than theirs. I don't even know how we got there, but there we are, and we're going to move on now. We've got to operate from a place of grace, a place of forgiveness, to where you can truly look at somebody and say, I love you. Not say it because the Bible says you've got to say it. Because if you've forgiven, you can do it easily. Amen. Atmospheres affect us, and we have to battle to stay in the right atmosphere with the right attitude towards church, towards promises, towards people. Because, like I said, atmospheres affect people. You have to be willing to war. Listen, just because we have the ability to have the right atmosphere doesn't mean it always happens. Let's be real. You come into church many times. We talk about it in the back. You talk about it. Sometimes it's just there. Man, the atmosphere, just first song, first prayer, it's charged. And, and you don't have to work at it. It's just there. And then there's times that we come in and it's not. But our attitude isn't to be, well, everything's just off tonight. Oh, another song I don't like. Now, what's wrong with the music tonight? Something's just a little off time and seems... Sometimes you have to work at it. Sometimes you have to fight for it. 
how bad do I want the Lord to move in this service today? How bad do I need him in my home? How bad do I need him to move on my behalf? You know what? Things, the atmosphere just ain't cracking and popping like it is sometimes. I'm going to create one right here. I'm going to create an atmosphere of worship right here. And I'm going to let it bleed over to this one and bleed over to this one. And it, never, it may never start cracking and popping all over the place, but it can be cracking and popping right where you're sitting as you invite the Holy Spirit to come and deal with me. Accept my worship. Accept my praise. Accept my offering. We're going to have church right here tonight. If you want to join me, that's fine. But right here, I'm going to create an atmosphere. I'm going to fight for it. You got to be willing to war against the atmospheres and, and fight to create the right ones. The atmosphere in Jerusalem that we just described in many ways was just like the one we're in. Turmoil and struggle. The people felt forgotten and the people felt forsaken. And there was a priest there by the name of Zacharias. And the scripture says in Luke 1 and 6 that he was righteous before God. Don't get it in your mind that Zechariah was lukewarm. Him and his wife were both righteous before God. Walking in all. There wasn't one he messed up. All. It didn't say he kept most of the commandments. All. Go to the next verse. No, actually, no, there it is at the end. Go back to six. Ordinance of the Lord, this is the word I want you to look at, blameless. I know some of you think you could, but I don't believe there's anybody here that I could stick that tag on this morning. Blameless. But the scripture attaches it to him. Blameless. But even the most ardent Christians, even the ones that are most devout, filled with the Spirit, can allow themselves to get worn down by circumstance. If they're not aware, if they don't catch it, if they don't recognize it in time, and they get to a place where they begin to speak and give voice to the circumstances of the atmosphere around them. And they begin to speak in doubt and we begin to let the testimony of our lips give voice to the doubt that has crept into our thinking and give voice to, 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 to things that are contrary to the message because right there the Bible says he was in service doing the ordinances lighting the candles doing all that his job was to do so he's in the middle of service church as it were and an angel comes to him to deliver the message of, God, uh, of John's birth. And instead of rejoicing in it, instead of shouting in it, instead of going out and testifying of this wonderful miracle that God's doing before he'd ever even seen any sign of it happening, he gave voice to the circumstance of his age. Not only the age he lived in, but the age he was. He gave voice to the atmosphere of doubt that plagued the people of his day. And he says, I can't believe this. I'm too old. My wife is too old. This is impossible. He looked at the circumstance. You know, the thing is, the Bible actually says that the angel tells him that the Lord has heard your prayer. It was actually the thing that he was praying for. Do we even believe what we're asking for sometimes? Lord, send us a child. Lord, Lord, send me. We want to have a child. The Lord has heard your prayer. You're going to have a child. No way. <laughs> We're too old for that. And it happened right in the middle of the service. And how many times has the Holy Spirit come down and anoint a man of God to, be, to begin speaking right to the thing you've been asking for? Begin to speak to it. Your children are coming back. Your children are coming back. You're going to be healed of that cancer. You're going to be delivered. And instead of, yes, Lord, it's like, but my kid's been gone 30 years. My kid don't even really know what the message is about. They're out there. And, and the doctor says, I can't get better. Right in the midst of the service, under the anointing of the Spirit. And I want to ask you, is anything too hard for the Lord? 
And yet we respond to his promises. Our very prayers being spoke back to us with doubt and with negativity. But this is impossible. But Lord, and we speak doubt right in the face of the angel. We speak doubt right in the face of the promise. We have to fight to stay in an atmosphere of faith. To where when that word comes forth, we grab and go, yes, that's right, that's mine. Yes, that's exactly right, that's mine. And not, this can't be. This can't be. Oh, that's exactly what I've been praying for, Lord. That's exactly. Listen, the Lord goes around dropping handfuls on purpose, and we walk around going, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Handful on purpose. Lord, give me something. Lord, meet my need. Lord. He's going. And we walk right past it. I guess it's never going to happen. Because the world around us is pressing in all the time, and it's an atmosphere of doubt. It's an atmosphere of, of unbelief. It's an atmosphere of this can never happen. And you're surrounded by doubt. And you're surrounded by an evil and chaotic atmosphere. But that's no excuse. You know what's incredible? I was reading. It's in Luke chapter 1. After this account, I love how doubt took Zachariah's voice away. He could no longer speak, no longer praise. Doubt will take your voice away too. But what I love is when God brings his word to pass despite Zechariah. And it says they handed him a tablet. And he wrote the name John. It says his mouth came open. And the next 10 or 12 verses is him prophesying and giving glory and praise to God. And what I see there is a man who recognized his error. What I see is, listen, sometimes we come in doubt. Sometimes we come in fear. Sometimes we sit there in unbelief and wonder, is this real? Is that the moving of the Spirit? Is that really emotion? Well, I doubt that's possible. Be careful. I'll tell you this. God's going to fulfill his word with or without you. But when you see the word start to be in fulfilled, at least have enough about you to say, I was wrong. I praise you, Lord. I give you glory, Lord. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And Zechariah gives praise unto God. When his mouth came open, he used it for the right reasons. But even though atmosphere bothers us and attacks us and we have to war against it, it's no excuse because in that exact same time, in that exact same atmosphere, visited by the exact same angel, is a little girl walking to the well. But Brother Branham says she'd been in an atmosphere. They'd been talking about the message and they'd been reading the scrolls and they were talking about how good the service was yesterday. Is that how your Mondays go? Hey, it doesn't tell us. Monday might have been horrible for her. It might have been the worst day of the week. There might have been some rude people at the well. But all I know was she was staying in the right atmosphere. And in that atmosphere, there was a flicker. And out of that flicker stepped an angel. And it was the exact same angel that had come to Zechariah and told him. And he said, no, nah, that ain't going to happen. But he tells her something even more difficult. He says, you're going to have a child without knowing a man. And the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. I say in a world full of doubters, in a world full of skeptics, even like Tabernacle, let's be a Mary. Because Mary threw her shoulders back and said, be it unto me, Lord. Yes, right there. I take it. That's my word. I accept it. Let it be unto me. There's going to be a rapture. Well, I don't know. You're sick or going to be healed. I'm not sure. All oh, the prodigals are coming home. Be it unto me. Be it unto me. Be it unto me. I accept it. I take it. It's mine. You can doubt all you want. You can fear all you want, but I'm walking in an atmosphere of faith. Our hearts have been turned back to faith, and I'm walking in that. It's chaos everywhere. Things are impossible. Doctors report's worse than it's ever been. But we're walking in an atmosphere of faith. And I can say I believe today more than I've ever believed before. I believe now more than I've ever believed before that, Lord, you are my healer. That, Lord, you are coming back to take a bride. Lord, that you are going to heal Sister Jeannie. Lord, that you are going to heal Ron Spencer. Lord, that no matter what happens, 
we believe more than ever. I believe it is atmosphere that produces results one way or the other. There were so many quotes and things about atmosphere, and I had to kind of pick which way to go. But Brother Branham over and over teaches that it's atmosphere that brings the result. You know how he talked about taking the egg and putting it under a dog. The atmosphere would make that egg hatch. You got to get things in the right atmosphere. He says, and brethren, may I say this with reverence and respect to you as my brethren, knowing that maybe before tonight, before night, we'll all stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Look, may I say this, it's the atmosphere always that brings forth the product, see. It's the atmosphere always that brings forth the product, see. And yet you're going to have to be willing to fight for that atmosphere. Satan's not just giving it over going, man, y'all have a good time today. Man, I just hope the Lord just really pours it out in there. Let me know how it goes when y'all come out. No, he ain't outside. He's here. He don't miss a service. Because he's here to battle the atmosphere. He's here to fight your claim that you have a right to ascend into heavenly places. And he's here battling. He's in your car battling. Teenagers, he's in your room battling. Trying to get you to set the wrong atmosphere. Give in to the wrong things. He's in the home trying to make the wrong atmosphere. Trying to make you mouth off and be rebellious. He fights you every single day to create the wrong atmosphere. Because in the wrong atmosphere, God's children can't blossom the way they're meant to. The atmosphere all around us is filled with devils. We don't like to think of that. We like to think, oh, there's angels all around. And there are. But the atmosphere around us is filled with devils and tormentors. And they're constantly pressing in on you. Trying to squeeze you and to press you into an atmosphere of negativity and doubt. Brother Branham says this. Now listen. Satan is still here. This is 1964. Future home. That's the reason all these things happen. He is still here. And all of his evil forces are still here. Notice that's why the earth now is filthy. That's why the scum and ridiculous things that goes on, bloodshed, war, politics, sin, adultery, all kinds of filthiness goes on is because that Satan is the ruler of the earth and this atmosphere. He says, you say the atmosphere? Yes, sir. Both the heavens and earth now is contaminated with devils that can accuse us before God. Jesus is there to intercede for us, see, while the accusers keep pointing a finger saying they did this, they did this, they did this. So it's all contaminated, contaminated with devils accusing you day and night, nonstop. And they come and they accuse you in your ear and they accuse you in your mind and they accuse you before the throne of God. And we mentioned it earlier how, how, how they got there, but... We're going to stop for a minute and we're going to go back in time. We're going to see how he even got in this place and how man got in this place. Because we're going to go back before time even began and, and see how we got here to where it's such a battle for us to walk in faith and walk in the light because it wasn't that way for Adam. It wasn't a battle at all. That was the atmosphere that he lived in. The atmosphere there was faith and peace and love. He didn't have to fight it. It's what it was. Because we can live in an atmosphere of peace, an atmosphere of faith, an atmosphere where there's, where there's no fear, where there's no funny feelings right now. Amen. Even in the midst of the greater atmosphere that would surround us on a daily basis. We read in Genesis 1 that the world was without form and void and it was dark. There was nothing. It was without form. It was in horrible shape. There was no light. There was churning waters. Brother Brown says, the world was without form, and it was void, and darkness was upon the earth. Nothing but a complete chaos. He then says in power of transformation, and the Bible said in the beginning back there that the world was without form and was void. There was nothing but just a darkness of chaos. 
And what a horrible shape it must have been in. Nothing but, but, but way into darkness yonder, without light or anything, and the churning of the water, and that wandering star twisting around and around in orbits out there somewhere. It must have been a ter terrific mass of something lost. Like it couldn't find its way. Now what I want to focus on here for the next couple minutes is God's ability to take something like that and to completely change the situation. I want you to see as, as Brother Branham would preach this sermon and call it God's power to transform. You ought to go listen to it. God's power to transform. But he describes it as we just read here as an absolute mass of chaos. Chaos meaning complete disorder and confusion. It was an awful condition. But the Bible says there in Genesis 1 and 2 that the Spirit of God moved. Church, that's the key to everything you're facing this morning. That's the key to every trial, every situation, every prodigal, every sickness, that the Spirit of God would move on that situation this morning. When the Spirit of God moved, things began to take place. When the Spirit of God moves, chaos begins to come into perfect order. And out of that great chaos came the Garden of Eden. Think about it. This was the condition of the earth. And the Spirit of God moves. And out of that comes an Eden. Chaos to Eden. The entire picture changed because the Spirit of God moved and because a word was spoke over that chaos. There was a word spoke and the Spirit of God moved and it went from an unimaginable chaotic atmosphere where, where, where everything was out of order like a terrific mass of something lost to the most sublime, most perfect, peaceful atmosphere the world has ever known. Your world may be in utter chaos right now. Your situation may be unfathomable to you. You may have got a report that you never thought you were going to get. Your children may be in places you never foresaw when you were raising them in your home. Your health may be in a place that there's no way to come back. Your spiritual walk, your lukewarmness, your family situation, your, your loved ones are out there like a twirling star lost somewhere and can't find its way. But all you need is for the Spirit of God to move upon that situation. All you need is for one word, one moment, spoke over that situation in the most chaotic, most horrible, most terrible situation becomes an Eden again. It becomes a restored daughter, a restored son, a saved family, a family in harmony, a church in harmony because the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. All you need is for the Spirit of God to move. I don't see a way out. You need the Spirit of God to move. I don't understand how this is going to work out. My job's terrible. I need a new job situation. You need the Spirit of God to move. That's all you need is the answer and the remedy to all your troubles. The devil gets in the atmosphere and he begins to stir and he begins to work and whip up storms against you. But your chaos is not too hard for God. Your situation is not too hard for God. You just need the Spirit of God to move in that situation. One word. Church, I believe he's here to do it. I believe he's here to meet your needs even this morning. I believe he's here to move on your job situation even this morning. I believe he's here to drive that cancer out of your body even this morning. I believe he'll drive that anxiety that you've been dealing with out of your body even this morning. That spirit of depression out of your body even this morning. That spirit of cancer out of Brother Ron's body even this morning. I believe he's here to move upon the face of the deep. The deep and the dark situations that we don't know what to do with. And I just say, move on the situation, Lord. Let the Spirit of God turn loose in this place this morning. Turn it loose. And let's see an Eden come forth out of the chaos. Let's see a healing come forth out of the sickness. He can take your situation and transform it into a testimony. Into a testimony of his power to transform the earth is transformed there into an Eden. And in the atmosphere of Eden, there's no fear. Ooh, how good that sounds. There's no fear. In that atmosphere, they don't know worry and sickness. And in that atmosphere, Adam operates as a son of God. And he has dominion. And he operates in the power of the spoken word. 
He could stop the wind. He could move a tree. All by speaking to it. Because he had dominion. Now that Satan is going to ascend to at some point. And in that atmosphere, he was on speaking terms with God. I want to get this to you. Because there was fellowship in the cool of the evening. And God would come down and walk with his children. There was no sin to separate them. There was no reason that he couldn't do that. So he would come down and walk in the cool of the, uh, of the evening with his children in that Eden atmosphere. Because there was nothing between God and man. The atmosphere, as it were, was clear. But there came a time, as you well know, that that atmosphere changed. Everything changed. Because Satan wanted to get back into the heavens. To get back to a place where he could rule and operate from a position of dominion. And he had a plan to do this. And he comes and he attacks and he calls his man to fall. And in that fall, he steps into that position, and man can no longer operate there. And because man cannot operate there, now there's something between him and God. And so it breaks fellowship between God and man. Fellowship is broken. And now fear enters in. Death enters in. Fellowship with God is lost. And the earth is given over to the devil. The atmosphere is given over to the devil. And I want to put it like this. Brother Branham says, the heavens was shut off. Think about that. One day God's coming down. It's a regular occurrence. You're walking with God. I don't mean in the sense like we do. I mean in the sense like he came down and walked beside them. And they talked to him. And how was your day kind of talk? Like children talk to their fathers. That was a common occurrence. And the next day, the heavens are sealed. Shut off. Man completely separated from God. And now there's a great mist and a fog of demon powers between the heavens and the earth. Where once God would come down, no more. The powers was cut off. The fellowship was cut off. And as we saw there in our opening scripture in Ephesians, Satan becomes entrenched. As the ruler of the earth and as the prince of the power of the air. And man begins to wander alone. Brother Branham says after he lost his fellowship with God, he become a wanderer. Had to shift for himself. God taken care of him before, but now he finds he has to shift for himself. And it's a pretty hard thing. So he doesn't have a loving father to watch over him and protect him and guide him and direct him and feed him. And clothe him and care for him like he did. So instead of coming back, he tries to find his own way. He wants to make his own way back. Man wants to make his own way. He always has, always will, I suppose, try to find his own way. And every time he makes his own way, he gets it wrong. Take that for yourself this morning, especially, I'll say it for men. It's hard for us sometimes. You know how we don't like to stop and ask directions. No, I'll figure it out. No, I think I remember up here. There's this one road that we're going to take. Goes east. And we get it wrong. Sometimes we might get there, but it may take a few extra turns and a few roads you didn't have to go down. If you need to get back to God, just do it his way. Just repent. Just make it right. Just come back to God. And let him guide you. Don't try to do it on your own. And soon in this new atmosphere without fellowship and seemingly without hope, man begins to slip once again into the chaos that was there before Eden. A whirling mass lost. And the generations that followed the first Adam lost touch with Eden. Eden became a story Grandpa told. Eden became almost mythical Eden became something that was for a past age fellowship with God and worshiping God became optional and without contact and without fellowship and with the atmosphere clogged with demons and doubt they lost touch and the prophet of God says man in the fall has lost his conscience of what father put him on earth to do in other words, all the plumbing as it was in our brains and the outlets of faith has been clogged up. 
with the business affairs, with home life, domestic things. It all becomes so clogged up with that until God can't operate through those channels that he made a man for. He specifically designed every part of your body to work in a certain way that life could function. And he specifically designed it that he could function through it. But through the fall, man lost contact, lost consciousness, lost the why they were here, what their functions were supposed to be for. And I want to say you better stay in contact with God. Stay in contact with God and stay in his word and stay in fellowship. I don't care how good your home is and how good mom and daddy have it, how much they stay in contact. You better stay in contact with God or else you end up forgetting why you're here. Don't let it be long periods of time between your fellowship with God. I don't care how many times you've had encounters. Don't let it go camp to camp before you have another experience, before you have another move. Don't even let it go service to service. Stay in contact with God because what got man in this trouble was when they fell, fellowship and contact was cut off and they forgot what they were here for. They forgot their very purpose. So don't let it go long periods of time without that contact because that's how Satan got us in this mess to begin with. But I do want to say, and we'll bring this around here in a minute, that we live in a different situation than the saints of old because Jesus came and he made a way of access so that now you can have that fellowship once again. You can have that contact once again, but you're going to have to fight for it. But it's worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for. The generations after Adam, they, 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 they forgot their purpose. The generations after Adam for, forgot because all the outlets were clogged. And I want to say this, the atmospheres were clogged, and the same thing happened after the second Adam. Because now he has another body on earth, and it's not just my body, it's not just yours, but it's the body of Christ. It's the church. And they forgot what the body of Christ was made for. They forgot what the purpose of his body on the earth was for. Just like this body of flesh was designed in a way with every little part in mind. It was designed in a way uh, uh, that, that life could flow through it. God designed his church in a perfect way. And each part of the design plays a critical role in it living and functioning properly. We can't forget what the church is here for. We can't am let, let amnesia, as it were, come in and cut us off from what he put us here for. We can't allow the ideas of man to change why we're here. The ideas and doctrines of man to, to change the way we operate. We can't go for long periods of time without him moving in a service. We can't just say it's okay just to have an average service. There should be no such thing as an average service. You should be able to leave every service and be able to tell what God did for you in that service, how God spoke to your heart in that service, how you're going to apply it to your life, what came out of that service. It wasn't average. It was words of eternal life anointed by the Spirit of God moving over those words. Because it doesn't take long sitting in a dead atmosphere to think that's a normal atmosphere. It doesn't take long sitting in a formal atmosphere to think that's a normal atmosphere. This body of Christ is built for the supernatural. I'm going to remind you how he made the body. He made it for supernatural. He made it to soar in the heavenlies. He made it for the miraculous. He made it for manifest, manifesting his power. This body is for the heavenlies. It's built for manifestations of the spirit. Listen, the body of Christ can't stand the atmosphere of a chicken yard. The body of Christ can't stand the atmosphere of negativity. The body of Christ can't stand the atmosphere of chickens who go around and, 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 and nitpick one another. You know, that's what happens when a chicken gets a sore, right? Right? All the other chickens gather around and they peck it and make it worse. Whereas eagles, when they see another one of the eagles there scabbed over and down in the valley, they'll drop food to them. Brother, I see you're struggling. This might help. I see you're going through something. This might help. 
instead of, well, I can't believe you did that. What were you thinking? What is wrong with you? This isn't helping me at all. The body of Christ isn't made for the chicken yard. It's made to lift up above into the heavenly atmospheres. Never forget what this body is designed for. Brother Brown puts it clear right here. He said, if God designed man's body, he certainly designed the body of his son, the church. And he has designed us to come together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and have these supernatural workings of God outlets through gifts of the spirit such as prophecy and wisdom and knowledge and gifts of healing and all these other different gifts it's outlets that God lets out his power and lets out his revelation to the people that's how God designed the body remember one thing you didn't design the body I didn't design the body so let's don't go in church order all the outlets right out of the body to where God can't live and move and express himself the way the body was designed to live and move and express itself. It's designed in that way with outlets. Let's not forget what the body is for. It's to manifest him. Manifest his glory. Manifest his power. Manifest his miracles. Because the devil knows if I can clog up the outlets, if I can clog up the outlets, I, they can't get no power from it. If the outlets are clogged up and they forget that it's supposed to flow like this and it's allowed to flow like that and I restored the gifts here so that it would manifest my power, if they forget, then they can't get no power from the outlet. Don't let the outlets get clogged up even in like Tabernacle. Don't let the outlets get clogged up. I say we are coming to a place that we, we ought to let freedom ring in the house of God. We got to let the life flow through Evening Light Tabernacle. To, to create an atmosphere of life where God can flow through every one of these outlets that he designed. And God can manifest himself through his body that he designed. And that's why we drive it home so much. That's why we preach about it so much. Brother Branham says here that whatever is taught in a church is the atmosphere you will find. Boy, y'all talk about that a lot. I know that's the atmosphere we want. Y'all preach about that a lot. Yeah, yeah, because we want that atmosphere. We want the atmosphere where somebody can get to receive the Holy Ghost. We want an atmosphere where, where a sinner can weep his way to Calvary. We want an atmosphere where the miraculous takes place. And so we preach about that all the time. He says, and now we find out that those atmospheres, he says, and, and, and you get in wherever those things where faith is taught in a church, you'll find a church in that atmosphere. Where faith is preached from the word, the children live. Amen. And then in a way only Brother Branham can do, he just says it real simply. That's the difference. It's just life and death. It's just life and death. So we have to be careful when we go to labeling things with it's just emotion or it's just this or it's just that. Wherever you want to label it, whatever side of the things you well, they're just starchy. Before you go to labeling anything, Brother Branham labeled it as it's just life and death. Uh -oh, so how are we supposed to act? There's not a rule book. You're supposed to be free. That's how you're supposed to act. People sometimes get it wrong and they get the wrong idea and they think that we promote things like Azusa Pentecost and like we say they had their place in the restoration. We understand that. But what Azusa became was not freedom of worship because they had to. You had to speak in tongues or you had to run. You had to shout or it wasn't a good service. That's not freedom at all. That's bondage. We're not promoting that we want you to run, jump, shout. What we're promoting is freedom to where when God moves, you can move how God leads you to move. That's it. That's it. And if you have a problem with the promotion of freedom, that means you are promoting bondage. It's a matter of life and death. It's black and white. There is no gray area in this discussion. Are y'all for emotion? No, I'm for freedom. It's not... Singling things out, are you for this? It's, are you for freedom or are you for bondage? That's the two categories. 
That's the categories. We're for freedom. This has to be a place where we always will let freedom ring. Because if we're not careful, and I want to go down this just because I feel to, and it might take up a little bit of my time, but I feel to go here. Don't get to the place to where because there wasn't shouting, running, jumping tongues, that you don't walk away and think it was a good service. Do not get to that place. Many times some of the greatest, most powerful services have this sweet, solemn spirit that just drops in and deals with the man and woman's heart. Always be impressed by the word. The quality of the word, which the word itself is good quality. But what, what, what is preached and the way the Lord comes behind it and the way he operates in the heart determines or should determine how we label it. And not that we should label service. I'm just speaking in a way we can all understand that it was a good service. Because if we get to the place like it got in Azusa to where it was such a good service, we ran and screamed and shouted so much that we didn't have preaching. You're not in a good place. A good service is when God deals with hearts. That's a good service. Now we have preferences or we have times of refreshing in the Lord. Y'all know me. Y'all know how I feel and how emotional I get. I'm all about it. You run around the church right now. You ain't going to offend me. None. I'm for it. Sometimes we need it. But God knows what we need and when we need it. We do not want nor do we promote an emotional work up. Now, if God moves through the building and you get emotional, I'm all for it. Why wouldn't you? How can you not? I'll move on. Atmospheres produce. Atmospheres produce. Man fell back into chaos again, and after the fall, Satan ruled completely over the atmosphere. And I'm going to go quickly now. Darkness and gloom hung over the earth. Fellowship was broken. Heavens was shut off from mankind. And yet that was all about to change. I want you to think about the place that man stood with no access to heavens. Prayers couldn't even ascend. There was no access to fellowship. Man was that twirling star lost in a matter of chaos. That was the condition of man. But it was all about to change. Because the very one who originally had spoke Eden out of a chaos had spoke Eden out of turmoil, had spoke Eden out of that awful condition that the earth had been in, was determined once again to have fellowship with man. He was determined that chaos would not always reign over the hearts of his children. He was determined to make a way. I'm so thankful today that he made the way, and, and he, he was determined. And it was chaos in the beginning, and the Spirit of God moved. And then it was chaos after the fall. And God became flesh. Oh, hallelujah. The Spirit of God moved and brought an Eden. And then there fell and then there was chaos. And then God became flesh and stepped, in, and stepped down into earth. And that flesh came down in the most chaotic time. And he came down in that time to show how a man can create an atmosphere around himself of peace in the midst of a storm. He came and showed how that Satan may be the prince of the power of the air and, and he may be able to stir things up and, and bring up a storm and bring things up against you, but he was still subject to the word when the word would stand and say, peace be still. He came to show that even though he's the prince of the power of the air, when you take the word upon your lips on the mouth of a believing man or woman, it's the same as deity speaking. And he may have put his foot up on the bow of a boat and stopped a physical storm, but what about the storms in your life this morning? He came so that you would have a way back, so that you would have fellowship, so that you would be on speaking terms again, so that you, like Adam in the garden, could look at that wind of sickness in your life, that wind of turmoil in your family, and you could stand there and put your shoulders back as a redeemed son or daughter of the living God and say peace be still and the winds have to calm down the storm has to calm down and the seas have to become calm he came to show that that's how man could operate and he came into this atmosphere that was cut out that had been cut off from the heavens to do battle against the enemy to do battle against spiritual wickedness in high places 
And this is what I came into as I was studying about atmospheres, and it just thrilled my heart. Maybe it's just common knowledge to everybody, and, and I don't know, but I've just never seen it like this before. Yes, he came to conquer sin, and he came to conquer death, hell, and the grave. But there's a peace that we often overlook. Brother Branham says the ascension is not talked about enough. He says he came to conquer atmospheres and all the evil that was there so that you once again could return to heavenly places and have access to the heavens once again. So that your prayers could go up before God and so that his answers could come down to you. He said there's so little spoke of this ascension. It's one of the greatest days when he ascended up. Because all over the earth since the day in the Garden of Eden that sin was committed, all heavens was shut off from mankind. When he was on the earth, he conquered passions, pride. He conquered sickness. He conquered devils. But when he died, he conquered death. When he arose, he conquered hell. And when he went up and he conquered everything that was against mankind, it then went into the wine press of God and crushed it down and conquered death, hell, grave, sickness, formalities, everything else, and overcome it all. And rose on the third day and conquered all the atmospheres above and he cut the mist between God and man and he connected heaven to earth again. Glory to God. Once again, man was connected. He ripped through the atmospheres. He ripped through the demons and he made a highway as he went back up past the moon, past Mars, through the Milky Way. He tore through the atmosphere of devils. He said, and as they went out, he conquered the grave. Then there was a great mist hanging over the earth yet. So he had to conquer that mist of sin, that mist of stench of the sins of the people. And with his own blood, his vesture dipped in blood, he conquered the atmosphere above. Blessed be his holy name. He cut the fogs of hell from place to place until he cut a hole through the sky. Adam's lost children could pray through to victory. He conquered the atmospheres. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered hell. And he rose triumphantly. Hallelujah. Satan sits there and says, you don't have a right. You don't have a right to come into heavenly atmospheres. You don't have a right. Oh, I do, Satan. There was a mighty conqueror. And he rose through the atmosphere. And he tore your hold upon it. You may be the prince of the power of the air. But I have a right to say, peace be still. I have a right to worship here. I have a right to live here. I have a right to abide here. Jesus made a way. Hallelujah. He conquered atmospheres. No man could see the glory of God. No man could understand. The glories of God were shut off. The powers were shut off. Fellowship was shut off. But our conqueror tore through the midst of demons. Tore through the fog of demons and granted us access to heaven once again. Granted us access to God once again. He ripped the veil of atmospheres and paved the way not only for us to be able to sit in heavenly places now, but he paved a highway because he knew one of these days I got a bride coming. How's she going to go? He made a way. He paved a highway. He, listen, we couldn't have went up before the atmosphere was conquered. No man ascended up. That's what the scripture says. We couldn't ascend up. We couldn't go there. It was clogged with demons and torments. But he said, I got a bride coming. And she's going to come up through the atmosphere. She's going to rise up to meet me in the air. And so he tore a highway. And he marked it well with his own blood. And he said, this is the way. This is the way. Rise to meet me, little bride. Yeah. Brother Brown says, the Bible said, he ascended on high and gave gifts unto men. There was an atmosphere hung over the earth of darkness, of gloom, of death, and weary. The prayers couldn't come up because the atonement wasn't made. But he broke through that veil, and he opened up the way. The atmosphere may be full of demons this morning, church. It may be full of devils, but there is a highway made right through it all. There is a highway into glory. And one of these mornings when the trumpet sounds... One of these mornings with the trumpet sounds, we're going to gather with our mighty conqueror. Think about this now. It's just me. I liked it. 
Right there in the place that Satan can supposedly controls. Right there in the place that he laid claim to. Right there where he blockaded all men. Where he had warred with angels. Where he had blocked our blessings. You say blocked our blessings? Yeah. Brother Branham says... All the sins that's in heaven above. He is the prince of the power of the air. He keeps off the blessings from God. In there comes thunderbolts of lightning and strikes the earth and everything from the heavens. Sheets of slicey rain, typhoons, storms and everything comes from above. Which is Satan? The prince of the power there. Look, we saw this in Daniel. We saw this in the book of Daniel 10. Where he had to wait 21 days because the the, the prince of the power of, of Persia battled the angel to keep him from getting to Daniel. Satan has laid claim to those atmospheres for years and years and years, and yet Jesus made a way that we can make a claim to them because they rightfully belong to us. And he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air and so we shall ever be with the Lord it shows it's been reconquered it shows that we have a right to it it shows that that's a place that we can operate from live in abide in we can listen we're called to rise above this Laodicean atmosphere you're called to rise above that depression that's holding you down you're called to rise above that anxiety you're called to a heavenly atmosphere and he paved the way just walk up the king's highway this morning just rise above it a little bit this morning And fight for your God-given atmosphere. Because now we have a right. We have a right. Yes, it is the atmosphere of the end time. But we can sit in heavenly places. And live in an atmosphere of the Holy Ghost to where our lives are not dictated by that atmosphere. I'm going to skip some of this now as 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 I bring this down. Brother Branham taught us very clearly that it's atmosphere that does it. It's worth fighting for. Every service, every devotion at home, every moment, conquer the atmosphere around you. Fight for the right atmosphere around you. He says, well, that's what the word of God is. If you take any promise of God and place it in the right atmosphere, it'll produce exactly what it is is in its life we will get and I'm gonna bring this down and and yes I'm talking about your life and not just Sunday Wednesday but I'm gonna bring this down to service for just a minute we will get we will receive what we get based off the atmosphere we create you say brother I disagree it's the word that does these things it's the word that we got to have true We must have the word, but it must be placed in the right atmosphere in order to produce what that word promised. Listen to Brother Branham here. This this was amazing to me. So what difference does that make? I don't care how many nails you got, how many pieces of cross you got. We need to produce this word again. Amen. Put it on a cross, on a nail. Not on a cross or on a nail, but on the living atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. That brings forth the results. God's word under the right atmosphere will produce exactly what it says it will do. It's got to be in the right atmosphere, though. You can't lay it over in the seminary or some Bible school that don't believe in signs and wonders. It will never happen. So you take this exact word and you place it somewhere that don't believe in it and it has no power. Well, those things never happen in our church. Well, I know. You don't believe in it. Well, we do believe it. Well, Brother Branham says that the atmosphere of the church will be what is preached. So if you believe it, preach it. But you lay it in a place that has no atmosphere, it will do nothing. He says it's got to be in the right atmosphere. You can't lay it over in the seminary. It'll never happen. It'll never break forth and bring life there. The atmosphere is wrong. You got to put it in the right atmosphere. So listen, he says we can't have a healing service until people get in the spirit of a healing service. 
We can't have a filling of the Holy Ghost until people get in that kind of atmosphere. So apparently, there is a that kind of atmosphere that goes along with people getting filled with the Holy Ghost. And the people was in the atmosphere in that day to bring judgment upon the earth, and they're in the same atmosphere today. I'm going to read this quote. It's a little long. He says, they was blessing God for the Holy Ghost. He's talking about the day of Pentecost. Why didn't it come sooner? Which had never come yet, but they believed that it was because God was going to keep his promise. And when they kept blessing God until the atmosphere got right, then there came from heaven like a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house that were sitting there. See, the atmosphere got right. Oh, could we get an atmosphere here that every crippled, every blind, every sick person, everything all with one accord, believing. He said, I seen it just last week in Wood River where there wasn't a person left. They just piled up the crutches and wheelchairs and cots. I was standing at the platform preaching like this, and they just began to raise up and throw them in the corner. Why? The atmosphere got right. What would happen if we would come together in every service Determined to get the atmosphere right. Determined to do my part. Not worried about what other people... Listen, I can't worry if you're not worshiping. I can't worry if you're worshiping really loud. As a matter of fact, I shouldn't worry what you're doing any, at all. When it comes to worship. Now, when it comes to standing here, it's a little different. It's difficult to not worry about it when you're asleep on me. But when it comes to worship, it's my job to worry about my worship. And if I will just be determined to do my part, because I know when I come, I know he's going to try to hinder. I know he's going to try to fight. I know it's not always going to be easy. But we have to remember we are the creators of atmospheres, and we have a right to sit in heavenly places. We have a right to the things written in the word of God. We have a right to the power of God moving in our midst. We have a right to worship him in spirit and truth. And if the atmosphere is what brings on the supernatural, then why wouldn't we want to do everything within our power to create a supernatural atmosphere? Every single time we come together and make sure the atmosphere gets right. Amen. Brother Branham says what we need is a Holy Ghost atmosphere. That's right. An atmosphere where the power of God's moving. One accord, one place, gathered together under that atmosphere of expecting God to move down and do signs and wonders. Amen. Let's move ourselves up. Amen. Now, for the people that think this is elementary, Brother Branham says it's moving up because that atmosphere is now available to us. He says, let's move ourselves up into that bracket. So an atmosphere of the Holy Ghost, an atmosphere of signs and wonders and shouting and tongues and prophecies is a move up. He said, let's move ourselves up into that bracket, step up in faith, move out of these three dimensions up into that next one. Amen. Say, Lord, I'm just believing you're going to pour out your blessings. I'm expecting it now. All things are moving right in, and I'm expecting to see exceedingly abundantly. Now I'm expecting it. You come down and say, now listen, you come down and say, well, I don't know about it. He goes right from that to but you come down and say, well, I don't know about it. Does that sound super negative? That's not awful. That's not like saying, well, that's just a bunch of work up. Well, that's not right. That wasn't the spirit. Now, that's harsh. But he says you're just sitting there going, I don't really know about it. Well, you see, you've hurt the other person. Well, you see, you've hurt the other person because it's a battle for atmosphere. You just put a log on the fire of negativity. And now it's burning a little brighter next to the other person who was trying to push through, who was trying to fight into that atmosphere and break forth. But your little seed of doubt was an anchor The atmosphere you create right now, just judge yourself. Judge yourself right here or in any service. It either benefits the service or hinders. There's no such thing as in between. 
There's no such thing as, I was just an observer. Well, then you hindered the service. I'm sorry. That's just, that's how it is. This has nothing to do with how I'm natured, how I'm this. You know good and well, I don't believe that every single person has to run, jump, dance, shout, scream, the top of the lungs. That's not what I'm asking you to do. But did you enter in? That's what I'm talking about. Did you enter in? I, I didn't today. You hindered the service. I understand you had a bad day. I get it. Why did you have to put your bad day on all of us? Because you have the power right now, in this moment, in this service, to transform the atmosphere around you. Out of chaos came an Eden because he was the creator. And now that creator is on the inside of you. And you have the power to create personal, a personal atmosphere that welcomes God. Now multiply that personal atmosphere by 250. What kind of atmosphere could we create in this building right in the middle of Laodicea? A heavenly atmosphere. We could truly sit together in heavenly places as God moves however he sees fit through an atmosphere that welcomes him, that pulled on the word. What's that mean? I pulled on the word. I pulled on Jesus to come to my pew. That's what it means. Well, I'm not really a puller. Today's a good time to start. You know, I, I didn't really get spoke to today. Did you pull it out of the man of God? You operate the gift by pulling for the needs that you have. I never get anything. You never pull. You talking about me? No. I'm talking about whoever that hit between the eyes. I don't know, I don't know who it is. I have no idea. But I say let's get the atmosphere right in our homes. Let's fight for the right atmosphere in our services. Let's fight for the right atmosphere around us that other people recognize they've stepped into something different. We didn't even go into the, that this time. Uh, Brother Brown deals with individual atmospheres maybe at another time. But you have the ability to, for people to know you're different by the atmosphere that you live in. In an atmosphere where, where, where people accuse and demons rule and demons accuse, accuse and they influence. When troubles come into the church, I'm going to rise above that atmosphere. I'm going to change that atmosphere. When gossip and unbelief come in, I'm going to change that atmosphere. When Satan tries to come and make us cold and formal, I'm going to change that atmosphere. I'm not going to stand for it. Because, look, you know, we're in Louisiana. It don't take but a little cold front to mess things up. You know, they say natural types of spiritual, so I'm just going there. We had one day of cold and the world shut down. I know it's sleeted a little bit. I'm thinking we might get to stay home a day. My kids homeschool, poor kids. Public schools got out for a week. I gave them Monday. You can safely get from your bed to the classroom. There's going to be no trouble here. But what's my point? You let the atmosphere change a little bit. Let the roads get a little icy, and all of a sudden, we're all froze over. We're all stuck at home. Life changes. We ain't moving. But then let the sun start to shine again. Hey, listen, if you froze up a little bit, the sun's out this morning. If you've been froze for a little while, the sun's out this morning. It's time to thaw out a little bit. It's time to work those joints out a little bit. It's time to say, praise the Lord for your many blessings. God, you're good. I'm going to live in a heavenly atmosphere. I'm going to call heaven on the scene for my knees. I'm going to cry out to God. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to worship him. I say, create an atmosphere in Eden like Tabernacle where the devil ain't welcome, where cancer flees, where sickness flees, where bondage is loose into freedom, and Eden come forth in your life. Create a heavenly atmosphere where all things are possible. Just give praise to God. Heavenly Father, how we love you this morning. How we worship you. How we praise you, Lord. You are worthy of praise. Hallelujah. You are the Alpha and Omega. You are the beginning and the end. Lord God, we welcome you with our praises. Lord, come into this place, Lord. Change hearts, Father. Speak to lives. Lord, may we walk in an atmosphere of peace. May we walk in an atmosphere of the Holy Ghost. 
Lord, may we live in a place where all things are possible. He's a faithful God. He's a mighty God. He's a promise keeper. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. It's the worst atmosphere that's ever been. He hasn't left us. He's still on the inside of you saying there can be an Eden in your heart. There can be an Eden around you. Oh, when we create the right atmosphere and he begins to move, then all things are possible. If you can get the people to believe, then not even cancer will stand before you. That's the kind of people we are, but it takes the atmosphere. There is special atmospheres for special situations for special needs. He said it. You want healing? Get in a healing atmosphere. What do you think happened when the pool of Bethesda was troubled? The atmosphere changed. It was a change in atmosphere. He said, you want people to get the Holy Ghost? Get a Holy Ghost atmosphere. All my lights have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I seated together in heavenly places he's come down to confirm that this morning so that we can go into the atmosphere and create the atmosphere that we need to call him down in our situation because he's faithful he's a faithful God I love you Lord brother Ronnie led you through the fire four years he's been standing because he's faithful I have known you as a father. You're in the right atmosphere. Lord, I've known you as a We've friend. all lived in the goodness of God.
right, right now in this atmosphere. An atmosphere of faith, an atmosphere of believing. We got Brother Ron with this report. And we're not here to bring fear or preach fear, but I think you understand how serious where we're at is. This is the moment. We talked about end times and the and this is the moment to where God has to intercede. That's where we are. And just for a moment, I want you to think about the times that he's fought for your young people. That he's fought for you. That he stood in this pulpit. I've been right there with him, getting ready to come out. And he says, take me out the back door. And he walks out and pukes seven times as they're calling him up. Wipe his mouth and come to the pulpit. And preach under the anointing and the power of God. Right now. I want you to consecrate your thinking. To consecrate your mind. Lay everything else aside. And we're going to show what I believe happens when you get in the right atmosphere. We're going to have Brother Joe lead us in prayer. And yes, it's for Brother Ron, but it's also for you, Aunt Jeannie. Same demon. She's in a desperate condition too. Anybody with cancer is in a desperate condition. But I want you to pray. I don't want them just to hear Joe Adams on the recording. May the voices of the saints of God at Evening Light Tabernacle ring into the heavens, into the atmospheres that Christ made a way for us to enter into. He did it so prayers like this could go up, so that answers like healing could come down. In this moment, this time, will you pray with us for Brother Ron? Amen. I sent this to Brother Tim this morning as he was preparing to go forth and to preach there with the believers at Brother Ron's church. I said, draw your sword and fight like you never fought before. If you know anything about Brother Tim, he's got a fighting spirit. He's a man that believes this word with his entire heart. And because of who he is and because of how he preaches, each of us has been endued with that same spirit to never give up to never walk away from the battle. I said, you've been called for this hour and you've been anointed for this purpose. Cut your way through the victory for the Spencer family and cut your way through the victory for the family of God. Each of you here today has a need. It may not be cancer, but may be a loved one. It may be a son. It may be a daughter of God. I counted over 20 prodigals the other day that should be sitting in the house of God. Each of you have your own battle. You just heard about creating an atmosphere where the presence of God can come down. And each of you today have a sword that God has placed in your hand. And I'm going to ask you, David, I'm going to ask you, sons of God, will you draw your sword this morning? Will you cut your way through the victory this morning? Will you do that this morning? Then I believe we as a church of the living God, the church, even like Tabernacle, God has endued us, God has placed within the ranks of this church the atmosphere that the supernatural can come down and miracles can take place. He's still the God of impossibilities. He's still the God that heals. He's still the God that delivers. And Father God, today, Lord, we're believing for the impossible God. The reports say it's over. The reports say it's no use. The reports say that can't is dropped down and come from his brain back into his eyes. But God, we're not looking at the reports this morning. God, we're looking at the word. We're looking at the promise, oh God. You said that the people of God will believe. Lord, we believe the message of the hour. We believe that the word is true. We believe that we're sons of God. We believe that deity is here. We believe that the Holy Ghost has empowered the people. And Satan, we come against you this morning. 
Fisher. Take your hands off of Jeannie Camp. Take your hands off of Evening Light Tabernacle. Take your hands off the bride of Jesus Christ. We've been empowered in this hour to fight like we've never fought before. Now, Satan, we're drawing our swords as an army of God. We're drawing our swords this morning. We're not backing up. We're not backing down. We're not retreating and we're not surrendering. We're fighting today like we never fought before. We're fighting for the promises of God. We're fighting for the healing of Ron Spencer. We're fighting for the faith of Full Gospel Tabernacle. We're fighting this morning, Lord, that a living God is on the scene. Father, we're here. Lord, we're here as the man in the arena this morning. It's not the critics all criticizing the emotion, criticizing while we shout, criticizing while we believe, criticizing while we dance. But Lord, we're the ones that's been in the arena. And Ron Spencer, your servant, Satan has had him on the ropes. Blow after blow after blow after blow. But at this moment, Father, all I can think about through the service, the fight isn't over. Lord, as I just remember what Sister Erica, Erica Parker said, Lord, before she passed on, that dumb old devil, doesn't he know it doesn't end this way? And Satan, I want to remind you one more time, it doesn't end this way. There's a body of believers this morning who are uniting themselves together not only at Evening Light Tabernacle but across the globe right now and we're praying for Ron Spencer. We're believing for Ron Spencer and for the Spencer family and for the family of God and you would tell us in your word Father if two or three will agree as to touching any one thing that we can have whatsoever we have. What sake that we come today and we agree on this healing. We agree on this deliverance hands off of God's property. Take your hands off of Jenny Kim. Take your hands off of our prodigals. Take your hands off of our barren wounds. Take your hands off, Satan. You have no right today. We're sons and daughters of God. And we're walking in the promise. We're walking in the possession. We're walking in the authority that we have been properly placed by the message. Properly placed. Now our name on the check it's just as good as Papa God's. Write your check out this morning. Write your check out this morning. Claim that loved one. Claim that promise of healing. Claim that promise of deliverance. Claim that promise. Lord, we write that check today. Know that it's already been signed. I write it out for Ron Spencer. The Spencer family. Full gospel tabernacle. Total. Complete healing total complete deliverance from whatever form of cancer whether the shape no matter where it may be complete and total victory now father we agree together father we agree together this morning even the light do you agree together this morning church around the world believers the bride of Christ those that will be streaming in do you believe this morning there's been an atmosphere created it's been created right now the midst of chaos God is here to meet your need God is here to answer God is here to respond and I believe it Lord and we're going to thank you for it right now Lord we're going to thank you for it right now thank you for the healing Lord thank you for delivering Brother Ron thank you Lord God that you never failed us Lord God you never left us alone Father and we thank you promise we thank you Lord that it is a finished work Father we love you and we commit this time to you now Lord no matter what the reports we believe yours no matter how we feel we're looking to the promise no matter what we see we turn our eyes to 
the author and the finisher of our faith. And we call on Jesus. Amen. Sovereign Lord, are in his presence. Just softly sing that song, keep your needs before him. Continue to meditate on the word that's been spoken. Consume me, Lord, with your fire, your spirit.
say whatever it takes, Lord. With my arms stretched wide, we'll worship you. So I'll throw.
wait for that day when we can just give him all the praise we want to give him. We can just stay at his feet for a thousand years or a thousand more. Just worship him. Just say, oh, how I love him. How we adore you. everything to save nothing. Oh, how we love you, Lord. Lord, I want to tell you that over and over and over again. atmosphere will stay. Lord, stay in the vehicles with us as we travel home. Stay at the restaurants or the dinner tables. Lord, the living rooms where the fellowship may be. Stay with us in our jobs. Lord, stay with these prayers, I pray. Lord, I know there's a host of angels standing at your beck and call. There's a host of demons trying to attack the pilgrim of people of God, trying to stop the prayers trying to stand in our way. Lord, but just like a great rocket ship, I pray that they'll come straight without hindrance, without fear, without worry, directly, Lord, to your throne of grace. Many needs were spoken, but many, many more have been unspoken, Lord. But you see each one, dear God. pray that when we come back Wednesday, if you should tarry, as soon as we walk in these doors, sense the same atmosphere. As soon as we wake up in the morning, sense that excitement that you're going to speak to us again in the evening service. Be the center of all we say and do, dear God. Jesus' name we pray. I know Brother Daryl was looking for some help moving some chairs in the back. I don't know if that's still needed today or not, but those that need to be dismissed can. Those that want to stay and pray a little while longer, maybe we can just turn on some music and let you dismiss when you feel led. Amen. Amen. Keep these needs in prayer. As God would move amongst us this week, that the atmosphere would always be right. Amen. God bless you.